Good morning and welcome to worship with Zion Lutheran Church in Aberdeen, South Dakota. My name is Pastor Aaron Heidelberger and I am glad to welcome you uh, here with us today as we worship on this third Sunday after Epiphany. No matter where you're joining us from, whether that's over the radio uh, or online today, Facebook, YouTube, wherever you are, from wherever you join us, we're glad to have you with us. And we are gathered in these ways um, by the Holy Spirit to hear a word of mercy and grace in Jesus Christ. So welcome. Just a brief announcement for today, and that is a reminder to our Zion members that we have our annual meeting just one week from today, if you're joining us on Sunday the 24th. January 31st is the date of our annual meeting. We will gather at 945 here in the sanctuary for in-person um, annual meeting, but we will also provide opportunities for those who cannot be here with us in person. So uh, we will have a Zoom link available. You can join us online via Zoom. Or if you're not online and don't have internet access, um, we have a way for you to phone in, to dial in with your landline as well. So you should receive information in your mailboxes shortly that tell you exactly how to access either the online or phone in options. Our annual report is printed and ready to go for, for you to look over. Those are available inside the front entryway of the church. So you are welcome to stop by any time this week, Monday through Friday, to pick up a copy of the annual report and look that over before the meeting on the 31st. Or if you would like us to deliver a copy to you, just give the church office a call at 225-6755 and we'll make sure that a copy of the annual report gets delivered to your home. With that, um, we take just a moment to prepare our hearts and minds for worship. And as we do that, we begin worship with our invocation. Blessed be the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God who forgives all our sin, and whose mercy endures forever. Amen. I invite you into our prayer of confession and hearing words of forgiveness. Let us come into the light of Christ, confessing our need for God's mercy. God who searches us and knows us, you have shown us what is good, but we have looked to other lights to find our way. We have not been just in our dealings with others. We have chosen revenge over mercy. We have promoted ourselves instead of walking humbly with you. With what shall we come before you? Forgive us our sin and show us your salvation in the face of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved of God, you have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God poured out for you in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Receive the promise of baptism. You are God's child. All your sins are forgiven. Rejoice and be glad, for yours is the reign of heaven. Amen. Our gathering hymn this morning is, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light, hymn number 815. <laughs>
the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. May the grace and truth of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please join me in a word of prayer. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your spirit and make us worthy of your call. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Good morning, children of God. Thanks for being here with me today. I have a question that I want you to think about. So I want you to take a second here and close your eyes to think about what you would do. If you had to suddenly leave your house, what would you take with you? Now, think about all the things you'd wanna take, but you can only pick four. What would you choose? Would you take a coat, shoes, food, a computer, a phone? Would you take your pet, your books, your favorite stuffed animal, movies? It's so hard to think of leaving so much stuff behind. Part of me would feel a little sad because I would miss everything that's still there. And part of me would feel a little scared because what if I needed something that I left behind? What if I didn't take my coat and it was really cold outside? You can open your eyes now. Thankfully, we don't have to make those choices. But in today's Bible story, there are some people who left everything behind to follow Jesus. And I mean everything. Right after Jesus was baptized, he began his ministry. And he chose some men who would travel with him while he preached. There were 12 of them, and we call them the 12 disciples. You might think that these guys were really special somehow, like they had the whole Bible memorized or they spent more time praying than they did sleeping. But the truth is, is they were just regular people like us. They sinned just like we do. They weren't anywhere near perfect. And they didn't do anything to deserve to travel with Jesus and to become a disciple. But they did do one thing that made them kind of special. They dropped everything. The first two men that Jesus called to be disciples were actually brothers, and their names are Simon and Andrew. Simon and Andrew were fishermen, so they spent their days out on the Sea of Galilee casting nets and catching fish. It gave them food to eat, and it gave them money. It was their job. So for Simon and Andrew, fishing was everything. One day, Jesus saw them casting their nets, and he called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And they did. They left their nets, their boat, their fish, their home, their friends, their jobs. They dropped everything to follow Jesus. But that's not all. A little while later, Jesus saw another group of fishermen out on a boat. There were brothers named James and John fishing with their dad. Jesus called out to the brothers, and immediately they left leaving everything behind, including their dad. I can't imagine what that must have felt like, leaving everything and everyone they knew to follow a total stranger. So what about us? Do we have to set aside everything else we might do and not have a job or hobbies or leave all of our friends and family to follow Jesus? No, not necessarily. We need to have jobs after all, it's a good thing, and it's good for us to have activities or pursue hobbies that we like to do. But sometimes we need to make adjustments. We need to make time for prayer and for worship and for fellowship. And that can be hard to do sometimes. We have so many things going on in our lives. It seems like every day is really busy with school or work, our different activities, hobbies, or making time for our friends and family. But you know what? It's worth it. A life with Jesus is better than anything else that we can do or even imagine. Following him isn't always easy, but it brings us joy and peace and everlasting life. Jesus promised to be with us and to provide for us. He uses us to share his love and good news. So trust in him and trust in his word. So let's say a word of thanks to God by folding our hands and bowing our heads. Dear God, Thank you for your word. 
Help us to understand and follow it and help us to follow Jesus, even when it's hard. Thank you for being with us no matter what. In his name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being here with me this morning. From the book of Jonah, chapter 3, verses 1 through 5 and 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 29 through 21. Brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God.
according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You don't need to make it happen. Can you imagine hearing those words on a daily basis? That's not really how life works for us, is it? Without our efforts, without our actions, without our intentions, nothing happens. Because our lives are full of responsibilities, things we must get done. We must get our kids enrolled in school and then get them there every day. We must do what our work supervisors ask us to do on the job. We must work at maintaining strong marriages. We must pay our taxes. We must get to practice every day after school. We must take our spouse to those doctor's appointments. Without making the choice to do something, it simply doesn't happen. The bills don't get paid. That financial aid application doesn't get submitted. And the dishwasher doesn't unload itself. There is even a lot of talk these days about getting to work, fixing or repairing things that are broken in our society, in our political life together. And no matter which end of the political spectrum you may fall on, this is the resounding message. We must do something about it, whatever it is. Our gospel today is one that Christians have often interpreted to be about doing something. And it's not hard to see why. After all, Jesus gives commands here. At least we hear his words in that way, as commands he gives to the first people he calls into following after him, the ones we know as the disciples. So we often approach this text and Jesus' words wondering about what it is that we need to do to follow Jesus. But there's something else going on here. Because before Jesus starts strolling along the Sea of Galilee, searching out some fishermen, we hear these words. Now, after John was arrested, and right away, right at the start of this story, something is terribly wrong, unsafe, and threatening. The last that we knew, of John the Baptist, and we've been hearing about him and from him um, since Advent. But the last we knew, John was out in the wilderness proclaiming the arrival of the Messiah and baptizing people in the River Jordan. In fact, he even baptized Jesus. And all of a sudden, he's been arrested and is now sitting in prison. The authorities, the law, has caught up with John. And those authorities don't much like what he's been saying. And now they're using their power, their authority, to silence him, to threaten him, and put his very life in danger. And this is when Jesus comes to Galilee. These are the circumstances that draw Jesus into this place and among this people. He goes right into the heart of trouble, into enemy territory. And not only does he arrive on the scene, but he comes proclaiming good news, announcing something ground-shaking. The time is fulfilled. 
and the kingdom of God has come near. You don't need to make it happen. You really don't. The kingdom has come. This kingdom, this reign of God is not something that you invite in or affect with your decisions or actions or any of your good works. The kingdom is God's reign and Jesus is it. And here he is, just like John has told us. And not only is that kingdom here, but today, dear friends, it has come for you as well. The kingdom is here for you. And the coming of that kingdom means that Jesus is not just here, not only present with us, but he has something to say to us. Ah, pastor, there you go. He has a command to give us, doesn't he? It's right there. Jesus said it. Repent and believe the good news. So there is something for us to do, isn't there? Well, I suppose so, except that when Jesus has something to say to us, when he has a word for us, it isn't merely a, a command or a to-do list or even good advice for us. The word of this word made flesh actually makes things happen. It makes happen the very thing he says calls it into being. This is the Son of God, after all. And this word accomplishes something. Repent, as it is used in biblical terms, is actually a passive word. Repenting is something done to you rather than something you do. So you don't actually repent. You are repented. It's not saying to God, I can do better but admitting, I just can't. And it means to be transformed. And when it comes to us and Jesus, repent means we are transformed into, we are grabbed by God and brought into God's kingdom by Jesus saying so. So that you simply cannot be the same after receiving this good news. You can't help it. The kingdom of God has come near. You don't need to make it happen. Jesus isn't talking about behavior here. He's talking about belief. Believe in the good news. The good news is here. The good news is done. It is brought by the only one who could truly make it possible. So that now you are freed. Not bound by requirements that you cannot meet not bound by a demand to get your life together, but freed, freed to turn from belief in yourself to belief in the kingdom and the savior who is already here. Believing in the good news is believing that although you can't, God can, which is awfully good news because it means that Jesus meets you right where you are even in the place where you think you are least qualified, even in the place where you think you're not qualified at all. And this is exactly what happened with those disciples. First of all, in the shadow of John's arrest and imprisonment, Jesus does not gather around him people to defend him or protect him or speak up for him. He simply gathers fishermen, people with no powers to speak of. And they are hardly the ones who would normally be considered qualified to follow around a rabbi, a teacher in Judaism. A rabbi would usually accept the best and brightest students of Torah, of the scriptures. Those who had studied for a long time. Those who would actually seek him out most of the time and ask to follow him. But Jesus turns the tables and does all of the calling and calls these fishermen who are now not studying the scriptures, but out dragging their nets in the water or mending their nets on the shore. Follow me, he says to them. And then what does the text say? Immediately they dropped their nets and followed him. 
immediately. That's no small detail. These fishermen did not take time to weigh the costs and benefits of such a call. They didn't even pray for discernment to know if this was the right choice to make. They didn't consider the consequences of leaving the business and their vocation, the livelihood that they had received from their fathers. Their discipleship is not due to a choice they made. It was that Jesus was calling them. The word calling into being the very thing he said, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And it happened. And so it is with you too. You don't need to make it happen. Jesus' words, repent and follow me, aren't about giving us a choice about what behavior to take on or what action to take. When Jesus says something, his words call into being that very thing, the very thing he says. You simply have no choice in the matter. So this good news comes to you today. You can't help but be changed by this word that brings you, that pulls you, drags you into the kingdom of God that has come this day to you and calls you into being followers of Christ, fishers of people who long to hear good news for themselves. Amen. We'll sing together our hymn of the day, which is Spread, O Spread, Almighty Word, hymn number 663. <laughs> Living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dwelling in the presence of God with us, let us boldly pray for the Church the world, and all in need, responding to each prayer with, let us walk in the light of the Lord. We pray for the church, especially our bishops, pastors, deacons, musicians, and servers, that God's spirit empower all the baptized with wisdom to follow Christ's call. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. We pray for Sunday schools and for all parish education, for teachers and participants, young and old, that you, God, would form the faithful even when classes cannot regularly meet in person. 
Let us walk in the light of the Lord. We pray for the nations, for our elected and appointed leaders, for racial concord in our cities, and for those who've been considered our enemies, that you, God, would lead the world into commonwealths of justice and peace. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. We pray for those who are charged with maintaining an ordered society, for state and local law enforcement, and for the military, that you would guide the powerful to serve the common good. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. We pray for relief from COVID-19, for the fearful, the sick, for, and the dying, for medical workers, for all who await the vaccine, for the unemployed and the quarantined, that you, God, would uphold the world's people through this time of affliction. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. We pray for all who are sick, distressed, or grieving, that you would sustain and comfort those who suffer. We pray especially for those in or close to our community of faith. We pray for Beth, Kathy, Ernie, Joey, Pastor Heidi, Tammy, Duane, and all those we now name before you. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. We pray finally for ourselves, that as we pour out our hearts to you, O God, our faith in your divine mercy would be renewed. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. Trusting in the presence of God by the power of the Holy Spirit, we commend all for whom we pray, dwelling in the light and hope of Christ our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us pray. Merciful God, you open wide your hand and satisfy the need of every living thing. By your grace, use these gifts to spread your name and salvation through our community and our world. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now receive this benediction as you go into your week. 
May the God of glory dwell in you richly, call you beloved and shine brightly on your path. The blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain upon you always. Amen. Our sending hymn this morning, we sing together, Jesus Calls Us O'er the Tumult, hymn number 696. Thanks be to God.